much, Dana. Judith Polgar still, uh, still joins me. Uh, thank you, Judith. With two very inspiring personalities and a very good friend of us, just on my right hand, who uh, also plays chess. And by the way, Judith, we need a name for him. Well, there should be something which connects uh, us with chess, right? So mm -hmm. I think it's Chessy Bear. Chessy Bear. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, let's come back to our two very inspiring guests. Linda Mayos Hassi has a very interesting profile. She is now a first instance judge at the Central District Court in Buda, in Budapest, specialized in family law cases. Before that, when she was a teenager, she was actively playing chess from 10 to 16, and nowadays still plays just for fun. Thank you very much for coming, Linda. Thank you for the invitation. And Norbert Fogarashi is the head of Morgan Stanley's Budapest office, a leading center of technology and analysis of the Global Bank, employing a staff of 3,000 people and also a managing director, and he is a candidate master level chess player as well. Thanks a lot, Norbert, not only for being here today, but uh, especially for all your support for chess. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Let's introduce the first uh, subject of discussion I propose. Several scientists uh, consider that there is no transfer at all in between the qualities and, or abilities one develops in a very specialized field, like chess, for instance, and other fields in life. Other scientists argue the opposite. After 50 years in the chess world, I believe there is transfer, except when there is obsession, because if chess is the only thing in your life, there is nowhere to transfer anything. From the different experiences of your lives, what do you think? As we are talking about chess, let's start by, by Judith. Well, uh, I started to play chess when I was five years old, so I grew up with chess. Chess is my second language. And uh, I was playing competitively more than 30 years. And only after that, I started to do other things. But I do believe and I feel whether I'm organizing the Global Chess Festival or I do other activities or whether it's cooking or whether it's uh, arranging my apartment, whether it's raising my kids, I always use a lot of things to name a few to be resilient, to always change your thinking, change your plans, to take responsibility, to make decisions nonstop. And there are a lot of other things. But, uh, I do my creativity, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I do believe that for me in my life, definitely it transfers to everything else. I'm a witness of that. So, <laughs> <laughs> Linda? I agree. Um, I would refer to my professional life because this is why I'm here uh, as a judge. And I think the most important thing I've learned from chess is to be prepared not to be surprised. Of course, there are some surprises, but mm. if you are prepared, on a certain level, mm -hmm. you cannot be surprised. From, from my point of view, the opponent is not the parties themselves, but the whole case. Mm -hmm. So I have to tackle with the case, not the people. And uh, this is why I'm saying to be prepared is very, very important. And this is what I've learned from chess. Mm -hmm. Norbert? Yeah, well, let me start by saying how excited I am to be here and to be uh, having this discussion with you, uh, talking about chess, right, and how the skills we acquire in chess we can transfer to all walks of life. And within life, I guess professional life will be sort of my um, um, thinking or my area that I want to focus on. And yeah, the answer from my own experience, from my own life, is a resounding yes. There's definitely transfer. Uh, I grew up uh, learning and playing chess. Um, and the skills that I acquired there, um, preparation was already mentioned, decision making, we're going to talk about making plans and trying to stick to those plans um, have definitely helped me in my professional life. So my own experiences tell this, but I think there's also scientific studies now that show that kids who learn chess, right, who grow up with that game, 
ha are more easily developing those skills mm -hmm. that are then important for them in life and also in their professional life. Mm -hmm. Clear enough. Let's look uh, at a particular element, starting again by Judith, self-criticism. When a chess player loses, uh, he or she immediately does two things, congratulating the, the winner and analyzing in detail, in detail why he or she lost. Do you notice that by the fact of being a chess player, you are more self-critical than most people? Actually, I did realize that. And uh, the higher level you go in chess, the more critical, self-critical you have to be yourself. Mm -hmm. Because that's the only way that you can improve on yourself, on your game, or your, on your choices what uh, strategies you choose and indeed I do have this uh, all the time myself whatever I'm doing and sometimes people misunderstand that I'm critical to them no when I'm analyzing for example the global chess festival next day I'm going to be analyzing all these uh, things what went right what could be better because it's fresh and when it's very fresh the information it's very important to be critical and of course it's it's a mindset that you have this uh, self-control and controlling what you're doing all the time and i think this is the way to growth to to you to develop new things and new projects and and simply to be better from one day to another mm -hmm. what about you linda uh, I agree. Uh, Self-criticism is very important and it has its role, but um, in a professional life, uh, obviously you learn from your mistakes. As uh, you introdu introduced me, I'm working on first instance, so there is always an appeal, not always, but sometimes there are appeals mm. against my decisions, so I get some inputs from a higher level. Also, I check what I've done good, bad, and uh, reflect uh, on my work. But uh, the other thing is that not work on that too much because it just takes away time. Of course, you have to learn from those mistakes, but there is a certain level when you just have to give it away. I mean, just let it go because then you cannot uh, prosper from a new challenge mm -hmm. if you are stick on a mistake and focus on that one. And the other thing I wanted to add is not only self-criticism but self-awareness. This is mm -hmm. something also very important to know what I'm able to do, what, again back to prepare, what I'm prepared for, what is above this, what is what I'm capable of and to be conscious with this all the time. This is something also coming from chess, I think. Mm -hmm. Robert? Yeah, so as I think back to my own chess career and sort of studying the games of the top chess players, there's one thing when you make a mistake within a game, or clearly the game is not going according to plan. Mm. What I see is that the top players are much more resilient. So even in a difficult situation, they're somehow able to muster enough strength and put their knowledge together to to make, uh, make it as difficult as possible for their opponents. So that's definitely one aspect of it that I also learned from chess, that even if you can have the best laid plans, but sometimes, you know, uh, even the best plans don't withstand the first contact with enemy, as the saying says. So it may well be that things just don't go according to your plans. And can you readjust? Do you have the level of resiliency then to, uh, to be able to continue fighting? Uh, and secondly, when you're playing in a tournament, let's say you've lost a game, right? This is an example you gave. Mm. You congratulate your opponent. I don't know how sincere that <laughs> I was. I was also shaking on right? that one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is it's more a very optimistic a line gesture. <laughs> this is more more something in that in the heat of that moment. Your th that's not always the most sincere congratulations. Your immediate thought is on, oh, what did I screw up again? And you know how um, you know how can I stand up from such a state of um, of um, disaster, right? And and that's the other thing that I think is very important to apply to life in general and within that professional life, that mm -hmm. whenever you have failures or something doesn't turn out the way you had expected, and it's inevitable, right? I think that's what we all have to learn, mm -hmm. is that it's not like a straight path career that just takes you to the top. Um, how resilient you are to those failures, how quickly you can get back to a state of balance where you can then start to motivate yourself again, is a skill that you can develop 
through the game of chess. And that's something that I've learned for myself that, uh, you know, through chess where the stakes are lower, uh, you know, certainly if you're not a top level player, you can learn to acquire these skills of, okay, things are not going to plan, but I'm still gonna do my utmost. I'm still gonna do my best. And after a loss, I'll try to muster myself and get back as quickly as I can to a balance. Mm -hmm. Now, a chess player and a person who has to make decisions of great responsibility every day are similar in that these decisions are usually difficult, quick, and under pressure. Although the type of pressure is different in, in its case. You two, Linda and Norbert, can make a, a big difference in people's life uh, with your daily decisions. And you, Judith, can have a great influence on the quality of education of uh, millions of children through uh, your work for the Judith Borger Foundation. What elements of a chess player's way of thinking most influence the way you make decisions? I can mention some examples. Uh, discipline thinking, intuition, objectivity, ability to concentrate, global vision. Well, the list is really very long. <clears throat> Well, to make good decisions, you need a lot of things. First of all, you have to have a calm mind because you cannot make good decisions being nervous, being frustrated, or uh, being under time pressure. It happens, for example, in chess, when you're in time trouble, you have, let's say, one minute to finish the game. It's sometimes not the problem that you have short on time, but the problem is the panic you have that mm -hmm. you are short on time. So time element is very important in decision making and calmness. I would highlight, I think, these two. And you can always practice it. And it's very much on your mindset. How do you deal with something that did not go the way you want it to have? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you let things, uh, let it go? And you switch mm -hmm. yourself. And I think mindset is something uh, that we all have to think about, that how strong it can be. And actually, you can make a decision. I did during organizing this festival quite a few times that, OK, some very unexpected things happen. Mm -hmm. OK, this is life. Let it go. I said also to my team, we did everything. We have made all our preparations. Things happen. Small things, wars, whatever, right? And then you have to go move on. And you shouldn't take it so personally what happens. It does not happen to you attacking you personally when many people think that it happens. Even if it seems like it just happens to you. No, you have to let it go. And this is why it's so important what Linda was saying, the preparation. If you're always in training, then you can handle mm -hmm. very difficult situations. And this is why I was a good chess player, I think, because I had a daily training. So you have learned that <clears throat> Murphy's Law is always there. <laughs> it's always there. And you can make sure if you organize some event, there is something will go wrong in the last minute. <laughs> so that's why you have to have a very clear and positive mindset to be able, able to overcome and just mm -hmm. go forward and see the good things. Mm -hmm. What about you, Linda? Yeah, uh, what uh, came to my mind is that uh, the time is very important, yes, to make a decision in the right time. Uh, for me, it is very important to collect data to have the right decision. And in collecting data, you have to select the important ones. It's also in a chess game when, when you see what the opponent just moved and, and you start thinking, why, why, why? Of course you have to check why. But if you have a concept, mm -hmm. then you should, okay, there are some exceptions, but stick what you wanted to do and just, okay, check what he was doing. Yeah, nothing threatening. Oh, okay. then. Don't waste your time on side movements, if mm -hmm. I can say that. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to stick to your concept. Of course, if there is a big change, you have to be resilient and quickly reacting to change. But still, if you have a concept, try to do what you really want to do. And the other thing you asked about uh, uh, abilities and the qualities, what is needed to have um, good decisions. And for me, it's also very important to respect all my cases, all the opponents. It's, it's never good to underestimate the other side and the case. If it seems like it's very simple, I still do the same process. Okay, maybe it's a bit quicker because I can tick, tick, tick. 
but still respect the other side mm -hmm. of the case mm -hmm. of the party. Mm -hmm. Stick to the concept. I guess, Norman, <laughs> you have to do this daily in your difficult uh, job. Absolutely. It was very interesting <laughs> to listen to the ladies because mm -hmm. a lot of what they said can directly be applied to the business uh, mm -hmm. side as well. So maybe just to rephrase, pattern recognition. So the more a chess player has studied, is in training, is in that frame of mind, uh, the easier they will be able to make decisions and the quicker. So that's the same in the business life. Once somebody has been in there, has had experiences of failures, of uh, similar sort of decisions, then they will be able to make the decision more quickly because they had seen it before. Uh, and the time element that you did um, emphasize is also very, very important um, in the business life as well, because some decisions you just have to make quickly and the time is absolutely of the essence um, um, to seize a certain opportunity that only exists for a period of time out in the markets or out in the labor market. If there's a job opportunity, career opportunity comes up, you have to jump on it and act quickly. But in other times, just like in a chess game, it's a critical position. You have to weigh up the options. You shouldn't be rushing yourself to a decision because this can fully alter the game, um, game's outcome. So I think, and knowing when to act quickly uh, and jump on a decision versus knowing um, you know, that you actually have to spend more time and weigh up the options more carefully um, is the absolute same in the, in the business world as well. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of parallels that have, uh, that have also been mentioned here. And maybe the last thought, as you did, was talking about time pressure and you're down to one minute. And it's not really the fact that you're down on time, but it's the panic. Um, what I was thinking is uh, the decisions that you make in such a time pressure um, you have really already made them earlier because if you had already done the preparation, you had already expected that to come up, it doesn't hit you as a surprise, but you're kind of um, um, ready for the unexpected because life always throws these curveballs at you um, that, and you expect this unexpected, then you won't be as panicked. Then you will be able to stay calm and you should be able to make better quality decisions under pressure. Mm -hmm. As you can see, the parallelism is really a big one. Now we have seven minutes and a half for the last question. <laughs> um, artificial intelligence is beginning to influence almost everything. For example, as a judge, it can be very useful, as you have mentioned already before, in your work to quickly access thousands of previous uh, judgments. And if I remember well, Norbert, uh, you did your PhD in computational <laughs> finance, yep. applying AI techniques to problems in finance. But uh, for the moment, machines do not take into account the emotions or socio-economic circumstances of each person. How do you combine technology with your knowledge and intuition in the professional decisions you make? And in Judith's case, what advice do you give to chess players when it comes to combining their own ideas with that, what the, the computer says? I was on a very interesting and sometimes painful journey to experience this <laughs> myself because I was, I was in the very beginning, it was very clear that my style is very straightforward and very creative and I liked very unexpected moves to make and solutions. And time was important because to confuse the opponent and the psychological element uh, as well, it was, uh, it was very important. And then later on when we had the first databases, it was something very interesting, very cool. I didn't have to bring my 15 kilos of notes, but the real difficult time came for me when the engines came. They gave different evaluation, which was confusing. It, they su mm -hmm. made suggestion in moves, which I didn't understand. Mm -hmm. But by now, all in all, in the last 15 years, it's very clear that the computer started to get more to human thinking. And the humans, because we are using so much the engine, we are starting to think more like a computer. First of all, what disappeared in chess itself, before, when I was making my crazy moves on the chessboard, people were reacting, Jared, it's crazy, it can be good. <laughs> By now, having the artificial intelligence in computers, there is no single move that any of the player will say, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. 
But the game itself became very interesting because we trust the computer, but we still have to be extremely critical. And we have to understand the ideas behind it to be able to implement it ourselves on the chessboard when we are on our own already, not playing out of books and uh, using the suggestion of computer. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's uh, changing our life. It's changing the sport. I can say we are having a completely different sport than, than uh, nearly 10 years ago when I uh, mm -hmm. retired. It is very good to know that I am not the only one suffering because the way of computers <laughs> think. <laughs> what about you, Linda? It's the same uh, on the justice side. Uh, it's good that we have uh, that kind of help to have access to this database for previous judgments. Um, I think it's more critical with, uh, with law system who use case law. In Hungary, we don't have case law, but uh, we still stick to the written law. But in those countries where case law is ruling, uh, it means that uh, if you find another case, another judgment from the past, you have to apply the same situation mm -hmm. uh, to your judgment. And uh, well, I'm happy that I don't have to do that. And I can uh, individualize, so check all the, the single uh, components and, and uh, make my judgment uh, uh, according to that. Um, what you just uh, mentioned that, um, machines cannot uh, uh, evaluate socio and uh, this kind of emotional uh, elements. The thing is that I read an article which says that uh, it's not a bad thing, but a good one, because a judge can have biases by mm -hmm. that. And mm -hmm. machines are more objective than mm -hmm. a judge. <laughs> so you can argue on <laughs> both sides. And um, well, it's a challenge for judges as well, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Machines are more objective. No, but true, <laughs> true, absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, this is a topic that's very close to my heart, obviously, but um, with technology, chess engines, and now artificial intelligence, the first thing we have to lay down, these are tools, right? So these are not going to, there's a lot of talk in the business world, AI is gonna replace, you know, the jobs and, we, you know, I don't think so, AI is a tool that will help us because they are objective, because they are able to analyze data much more quickly and able to make conclusions quickly. So fantastic uh, tools that we will be able to apply and make ourselves more productive and improve the quality of our decision making, um, take more things into account more objectively. Uh, chess is really a simplified version of life. Um, it's very well constrained to the 64 squares and therefore we have seen how AI can be applied to the simplified version of life. Um, it's already made breakthroughs, right? Um, AI engines have completely outperformed the classical chess engines and we see that they work. And uh, chess is also a very well measurable sort of uh, um, 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 field or platform. And, uh, and it has really proven that these tools are, are really, really useful in that constrained world. And now I think we're in the process of applying AI to other walks of life and other areas of life. And obviously the test in chess has been very, very positive. And I think we will see, it will find its way and its right place in other walks of life, whether that be the judgmental system or whether that be the business life. And we already see that. So at Morgan Stanley, we already use artificial intelligence mm -hmm. to help our financial advisors give better advice to our clients. Right? Mm -hmm. They're not going to replace, in our view, our financial advisors. People will still need that emotional contact and they need a human right. to actually interact with them mm -hmm. and give them advice. Mm -hmm. But our financial advisors will be able to give better quality advice with the use of these better tools. Mm -hmm. I think it has been a very instructive debate. A million thanks to the, all three of you. And you, dear viewers, don't go too far because in a minute we are going to talk about a very important line of thought in today's world. Um, our, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about mindset and chess is very connected to that. And the next speaker is Barry Haima, one of the world's leading uh, interpreters of mindset theory in educational practice. He is an emeritus professor of psychology in education at the University of Cambria in the UK.